we return, ye faithful, to celebrate the rise of a new champion of equine arts and letters, and of oh so much more. And so it is to great privilege and honor that we have been called forth, the Dezidan, also known as Creepy Pasta Salad, has seen fit to answer many of the riddles that plagued the secret watchers in the dark, and bestow his abundant wisdom upon us. Come, let us stoke the hearth of the eternal flames and ruminate on great matters. Debonair. Masculine. Precise. Erudite. These are but a few of the words that overpower one's mind when one takes in your relentless voice. Esteemed conjurer, please share any personal details you care to reveal to the clamoring public. Well, despite being a reader of mostly dark fiction, I've never read Stephen King. However, one of my favorite quotes is by him. I like to tell people that I have the heart of a small child, and I keep it in a jar on my desk. I also love verbose memes and will probably never stop making them. Never stop doing what you're good at and enjoy. I am also a grammar Nazi. Seek comma! I also believe there is a time and a place for political correctness. In some circles, I'm called Big Money Dan because I have a giant quarter and I made a necklace out of it. I do readings involving My Little Pony characters, but I get very little hate for it. I guess people don't know what to say if they hate the show when the fact is that I'm the one making the characters suffer. Hum. Suffering ponies. Oh, sorry, back on topic. You have spent a great deal of time recording the dark verses of pony literature. What would you say has been the role of horror, grim dark, and sad fan creations in the My Little Pony Phantom, whether they be works of fiction, music, videos, or visual art? Oh yes, a frighteningly massive amount of time, no doubt. That's why I don't count the hours. According to Wikipedia, the success of My Little Pony Friendship is Magic can be traced to a counterculture movement known as New Serenity. It's basically where people believe that a lot of the cynical outlooks you find in the world are entirely unrealistic. Indeed, I am a believer in the philosophy of the movement, but I am also a strong believer in the kind of realism proposed by the likes of Niccolo Machiavelli. History buffs and fans of Fallout New Vegas will recognize the model of history's major movements as being dialectical. In New Vegas, a character named Caesar explains the concept. History can be viewed by looking at some big overarching question, to which the loudest present provide an answer, a thesis. Then there is an opposing view, an antithesis. Most of the time in MLP, the world is literally filled with sunshine and rainbows. This sincere optimism, I feel, is dramatically and at times persuasively refuted by the dark fanfictions which have arisen from the show's most serious moments. The show, Friendship is Magic, is wholly aware that there is some doom in the world. In one of the episodes, Twilight Sparkle follows Starlight Glimmer, an enemy, down a series of alternate timelines until they finally confront each other in a world that is nothing more than a bitter wasteland. There can be no shadows with no light to cast them. Excellent insight. One might go so far as to say that the light cannot help but cast shadows. In your view, is it fair to say that the main protagonists, and perhaps even Celestia herself, are responsible for some amount of suffering? Perhaps not reprehensibly so, but culpable, quite feasibly. Any individual who makes enemies and has instilled hatred in them has caused them to start drinking their own poison, as Gandhi might say. Whether or not they are right to feel that hatred is often not so, according to the show. In the words of Golbez, a character from Final Fantasy IV, too bright a shine draws eyes of envy. Speaking of shadows, why hasn't Clive Barker been prosecuted and imprisoned yet, or at least committed to a high security mental institution? Sadomasochistic wanderers of the void should not be allowed free reign to do as they please. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not the best read reader of my genre, so I had to look up who that was. Uh, more to your point, 
I say let them go, so long as they're not hurting anyone. Those who believe in Freud, one of the greatest psychologists of all time, would likely say that a lot of evil is actually diverted by the creators and partakers of the horror fiction, for they divert humans' primitive urges to cause and experience death and pain. As Johnny Cash said in the song Johnny 99, I do believe that I would be better off dead if you can take a man's life for the thoughts that are in his head. Well put indeed. Elsewhere you have spoken of your selection process when choosing stories to read. Regarding your own personal taste, what elements in a dark or sad piece do you find to be most satisfying? Regarding my personal taste, I love things that are proverbial. I adore passages that speak to the human condition. When things get deep and profound without being terribly abrupt or preachy or edgy, I tend to attribute it to the skill of the author. Generally, the stories I tend to like have something to say, although not always. I think there is plenty of writing that is entirely worthwhile, that is entirely to be appreciated at face value. Across my videos, I can definitely see a preference for tragedy. Granted, I generally tend to find them to be the most tasteful of the dark works. With that, uh, themes of remorse and crime and punishment. When really, really bad things happen, I, as well as many other people, often feel the need to have some reason for it, especially if the punishment seems actually disproportionate to the transgressions. In real life, they very well can be unjustifiable or disproportionate. In the show, usually this isn't the case because the characters in it are not totally beyond persuasion. In real life and in these types of fanfictions, people and characters can be inexorable, so suffering can follow. I think based off the number of Princess Luna, Pinkie Pie, and Twilight Sparkle-centered dark fictions I've read, a person might conclude that I have a preference for them. I do think I do a good job with these characters' voices in particular, but I don't really prefer them. I guess I just happen to prefer what I've read for them. Uh, you also don't tend to see much of Sakura or Applejack in fanfictions, especially dark ones, yet I like them more than most of the other non-principal ponies and the main six, respectively. Zekra, now there's a character for whom we don't have much of a backstory. Do you have a head cannon for her, or zebras in general? I actually haven't given it that much thought. <laughs> I would say, though, that Zikora rhymes everything she says, because she's so used to rhyming incantations for her potions. It has become second nature for her to do so. Were there any audio readers who inspired you when you first began to record for this phantom, or who continue to be a standard to which you aspire? The short answer is not really. I didn't really know anybody here, and nobody really knew me. As I have mentioned before in other places, I really don't get to listen to many others' audio readings. However, I did find out about Robapony, who basically ran his channel pretty much however he wanted. And there's one of the whole things about a whole bunch of people, across communities, you know. Uh, people run their channels and profiles as though they already have a following and basically fake it till they make it. I guess the philosophy is that if you are treated like a fan, you'll become a fan if you obviously like their content, and it sometimes works. I don't really make myself out to be any more important than I really think I am. I don't necessarily think Robapony is guilty of that, but I see it elsewhere. When it comes down to it, I'm performing voice work gratuitously for a controversial fandom that is past its heyday. Unless I start chasing after stories everybody has read, heard, or audio read in this fandom before, there is very little chance that someone not looking for underappreciated or forgotten content is going to find me. Pretty much everyone has their favorite voices from among the established readers, who just so happen to be much more prolific than I am in generating their content. Thus, I have very little opportunity to grow my channel's following to that of those who have preceded me, without entering something else. 
But I don't feel I'm really good for much else, except for doing the same type of story readings in a different context. However, there was a discussion between major YouTubers Jax Films and Michael Buckley called YouTube Relevance Anxiety, where basically they mentioned that each YouTuber basically has to do them. There are ways to make yourself more commercial and more accessible, sure, but I presume most people tend to start feeling rotten or going rotten when they do that because they really aren't doing them. Uh, what they're doing is no longer fulfilling. My channel isn't a commercial. It's a place for entertainment and for me to try to grant works that I feel deserve more exposure, some more recognition. It's also a place to get my theater fix and to try to put my voice out there, but I still do what I do. Flesh or meat? All meat is meant for jerky. Whatever flesh remains ought to be well done. Sue me. Which, in your opinion, are your strongest performances and why? I'll start out saying, uh, <laughs> through running my channel, I have come to realize that my view counts have not necessarily correlated with how strongly I feel I performed. However, Painless is among my best viewed videos as well as what I believe are my best done videos. I also got featured on Equestria Daily for it. In it, I had to voice a dejected Pinkie Pie who is battered mercilessly by three voices that are inside her head that are trying to convince her that she is nothing. One is angry and blustering, one is sly and rhetorical, and the last is soft and depressed. The whole video is full of emotion, and I had, a, and I had to voice a number of other characters and managed to keep them all distinct. That was also the first video that I made, that I combined recordings from two different days of recording, and the, tra the transition in the video is pretty seamless for one point. I also think that the story and dialogue carry it a good deal, but the way I was able to really embrace the dialogue and how well my voice just happened to fit the tale is probably what makes it special. The readings I did for My Final Confession and its sequel, by you, My Final Confession Vengeance, were also exceptional. The sequel was much more technically difficult, since the story is m told through connected documents, but I feel that I was able to convey the double meaning of the story with the subtlety that the text gave it, and then let it really manifest itself in the end with some creative voicing. When I do readings, I often get visions in my head, just as I do when I read. I felt myself in the vision with that one, and with all of the stories that I really connected to. As for the original, I felt I did a really good job working with two characters who are very grotesque in their own ways. I also felt my reporter voice for the narrator, main character, was on point. It was also the first reading that I did that I actually increased the tempo for my voicing. I think that I'm a little slow when I read, so I increased the, t I increased the tempo uh, by a couple percentage points to, to make it a little more easier to listen to. Eternity is one of my all-time favorite pieces I have ever read. It's a story in which an immortal Twilight Sparkle tells about the cyclical world she has consigned herself to chronicling. She confides her views on her existence and mortality. It's much more than just a sob story about Twilight regretting being immortal. Over the span of her life, she has really come to question things, or so the characterization has come to be. In reality, the author, actually, uh, in their author's notes, uh, wrote in the description that basically they put themselves in the place of Twilight Sparkle, uh, which, surprisingly for, you know, a self-insert story, adds a good level of depth. Uh, the writer is actually confessing their struggle with their own sense of what it means to be. I believe I did a good job playing both the roles of the storyteller in Twilight Sparkle and also the, you know, Twilight Sparkle that we see there. My reading for the series Friends Forever and Fading Twilight was where I was first able to play a lethal maniac. I don't really get chills from stellar performances or good music, however, often when I go back through my readings, I'll listen and have one of those aha moments, where I listen and find that there's something that, like, 
there's absolutely no better way I could have audio read what was there, and it was just so spot on the way I did it. Those readings in particular are just full of those moments. In particular, I also did my first major evil laugh in a performance. <laughs> Let me tell you, I really suck at evil laughter. There's no way for me to do it without being, like, cheesy, wrong, or just sounding ridiculous. It's, um, it's been done so well by so many gifted people. You'll notice that I did not laugh anywhere where Pink Amina was supposed to laugh in really any of my readings. I can't do a convincing giggle, or at least I can't convince myself that I can. And uh, when I laugh, I generally tend to have a wheezy laugh, uh, especially when it's a good hard laugh. Anyway, it's in the second chapter of uh, Fading Twilight, and uh, someone a couple weeks ago commented, maybe not a couple weeks ago, but maybe like a couple months ago, uh, someone commented anyway that uh, my evil laugh in there reminded me of Kira's laugh from Death Note. Uh, I never actually watched the anime, but I know that laugh, and I... Uh, I can't honestly recall if I had been trying to emulate that laugh, but it did sound similar, and the effect, I feel, was pretty comparable. Uh, DeGrave of Blue Blood, which was basically uh, an MLP adaptation of Edgar Allan Poe's The Cask of Amontillado, is a real star to me because of how well I voiced the two characters, uh, Drunk Prince Blue Blood and Fancy Pants. I may have mentioned before, but I do angry voices really well, and at least I feel I do, and even though I have no real, like, posh accent uh, in the way that I normally speak, I managed to assume one there and still managed the outbursts. I also think my voicing for Blue Blood was hilariously well executed. It's probably, I, I would say, one of my personally underappreciated readings. I also really loved my performance for Crusader's End. Uh, again, overall great voice acting for a poignant story in my opinion. Uh, my reading of the week was another story that was uh, featured on Equestria Daily. Uh, I said to myself when I started out, that I would never attempt to read a story concerning the struggles of a soldier, because that is something that I would never understand. But the writing was so good for that one particular work that I connected with it, and I felt it was worth an attempt, and my attempt, I feel, was very worthy. I did a lot of gruff voices in that one. And for my last recommendation, I guess, uh, I would say Changes by JMJ. It has both tragic and grim dark elements, and something about JMJ's writing always makes his stories resonate with me. When we talk about stories that have the right kind of edge to them, that's one of them. JMJ is certainly a beast when it comes to diction, flow, and clarity. It's a shame we haven't seen more from him. Often it's a struggle for authors of dark fiction to keep going in the face of negative, sometimes baseless feedback when they're only trying to express themselves like everyone else. Is there anything you'd like to say, as a purveyor of creative works, regarding what is appropriate and helpful commentary? Actually, yes. In this day and age, a lot of bickering and pretense have come to characterize the critique. In writing critiques, critics aim to make themselves known by being entertaining. Uh, a few years back in 10th grade, <laughs> so that's like four years, over four years, I had a theater arts class, and if there's one thing I'll never forget from that class, it's the thing my teacher said about writing any good critique. A good critic never has fun at the expense of the artist. Effective critiquing comes down to a few things. Stating what was good, pointing out what you thought were opportunities for improvement, and explaining what biases you might have in doing so, and writing it all with some degree of diplomacy. Are you open to collaborations with other audio readers? How should they contact you? 
You know, that's a funny thing. On one hand, I've declined several people to wait at least until I'm out of college and have the time to properly commit to such a project. I really am very busy because my degree is tough, because uh, I'm pursuing actuarial science, and my school and exam preparation work come first. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm always, I've always wanted to try. And even if it meant putting off some of my already late projects on the back burner. Really, I'm doing these readings solo because I have very few artistic outlets available due to my time schedule. And if I go it alone, I know when I can work and uh, uh, about how long it will take me to get done with the projects. When more people get involved, things require more coordination, at the very least. I would say that I would be interested only in short projects for the time being. Things like individual comic dubs about, or like short stories, and possibly bad fanfic readings. I really don't want to disappoint anyone due to my limiting schedule, and I also, since I have uh, such little time allotted for readings in the first place, I also don't want to have my time wasted. I do tend to have more time over the summer, but again, it's iffy because I don't know whether I'll have to study for an actuarial exam or, you know, end up exhausted by work half the time like I did last summer because uh, I was a busboy. Um, if anyone watching is interested in doing a collaboration with me, please let me know. I am collecting names for when I do graduate and have a regular schedule. You can notify me by YouTube's private messaging system or on my fimfiction.net profile, which is, uh, it's like the, uh, brown button, uh, on my channel page. You can, uh, click on that, uh, right by where my banner is on the right side of my channel. Uh, if you click on that and you have a profile there, you can send me a private message. Uh, if you'd prefer to message me via email, uh, you'll have to let me know in either of those two places. Uh, I'm not comfortable with, uh, giving my email address out in a public video. <laughs> But, uh, that's how you can reach me. If you could reproduce or closely approximate a well-known voice from movies, voiceover, or music, whose would it be? And for what project would you use it? Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> um... Uh... Johnny Cash has been a musical inspiration to me since I first came into music in, like, seventh grade. I don't think his sound will ever leave me. Uh, for country voices, aside from other obvious influences, uh, Johnny Cash's dialect will be at least partly an influence. My voices for Applejack and the like do not sound like him, though. Um, and while I'm not really great at impressions, at least not at doing consistent mimicries of others, uh, I've often said to friends that if I could replace my singing voice with uh, somebody else's, I would probably pick that of Paul Robeson or Anthony Warlow. Uh, Paul Robeson is like a, a tremendous bass voice. Uh, he was uh, part of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, just a gorgeous, gorgeous bass voice. And then uh, Anthony Warlow, he's got he's got a fantastic range. Uh, he's kind of significant in the music theater, uh, musical theater uh, field. And I, I mean, he can sing like close to counter tenor, uh, but also get really, really hard, you know, bassy type vo voice notes out with his voice. Uh, there are a whole bunch of one-liner impressions I can do, uh, and I suppose if I did enough voice study and practice, I could probably emulate some of them. Uh, Quentin Flynn as Axel in Kingdom Hearts 2. The name's Axel. Got it memorized. <laughs> but that means a man's a beast, though. Like, I would not... <laughs> Trying to emulate Quentin Flynn is, like... A total poser move to me just to me you know uh, because I respect his work so much uh, I also love discords line from the MLP show uh, I guess we're due for a big old storm of chaos <laughs> love that line uh, when I was younger, I loved the voice of the character Sir Raleigh the frog from the original Sly Cooper video game 
Oh, how I'm ever so sorry. How sloppy of me not to finish the job when obviously we should have snuffed you out as well. So, without further ado, I shall make amends by doing uh, what? Bloating to gargantuan size and squashing you like the insignificant bug that you are. And I can't forget the voice of uh, Maximilian Pegasus from the Yu Gi Oh! anime uh, English dub. Yugi Boy. <laughs> love that. Oh man, lo love it. <laughs> Maximilian Pegasus was like. Like, the guy that I wanted to be when I was younger. Like, I, I, like if I wanted to be rich, I wanted to be filthy, stinking rich like him. <laughs> and anyway, uh, off topic. Uh, and then the first voice actor I ever, like, looked up to, uh, well, looked up the name of, uh, was uh, George Newbern for his voicing of Sephiroth in the various installments of the video game Final Fantasy VII. Uh, I can't do a good Sephiroth impression, though. Um, and the one voice, though, that I have consciously tried to channel was an imitation of David Hayter's voice for Solid Snake in the Metal Gear Solid video game series. Uh, the first time that I tried that specific impression was my voice for Karazcha, a changeling, in uh, my early MLP reading Live's End. I know I can't perfectly emulate uh, Solid Snake's voice. Uh, someone pointed out, actually, that I uh, sounded like the Joker, uh, Heath, Heath Ledger's Joker from, uh, from the Batman movies. I've not seen much of those movies, but I did do a comparison, and I could hear it there. Um, anyway, if there are soldiers involved in any story that I read alone, chances are one of them is going to be voiced with that particular sound in mind. Impressed by your actuarial skills, Nightmare Moon has invited you for a one-on-one -on -one interview to discuss a royal strategist position over dinner. What is on the menu, and what is the risk associated with declining to partake in the meal, should it prove to be cooked too rare? Or Celestia forbid, a la tata. Mmm. <laughs> mm, I, I, I don't I don't know what a la tatar means. Uh, but uh, if it means with tartar sauce, I would be greatly disappointed because I hate mayonnaise. I hate anything that can be like strongly associated with fish. You wanna torture me? <laughs> You want to torture me? Force me to eat sushi with that disgustingly fishy seaweed wrapping. Anyway, seeing that Nightmare Moon is probably an enterprising individual who would probably already have a good idea about my mannerisms before she were even to call me to such a meeting, I would presume that she would likely serve whatever she thinks I would eat. Uh, I'm rather finicky, so it would probably consist of some, like, pasta with garlic bread and celery and ginger ale, uh, as a drink, because I love ginger ale, and, uh... <laughs> However, <laughs> the the implication uh, of your question leads me to believe that you mean something a little more sinister. Uh, that would mean uh, th that it would consist of some various meats, which are not typical foods for equines, but not totally indigestible by them, uh, for that matter. Uh, and you suspect that she might serve them to me undercooked. Uh, being, being that I'm a guy who likes meat and prefers it very well cooked, uh, this would be quite upsetting indeed. Uh, surely at a palace like hers, each item would be made in accordance with her exact wishes, so it would be deliberate if it were undercooked. And, uh, if the food before me were intentionally and perceptibly tainted, uh, it would probably not be in my best interest to point it out. But if she wanted a working brain, she'd do well not to sicken it. And uh, if she were to unpleasantly surprise me in that way, I would probably tell her so. 
But then again, the meeting may not be for the stated purpose of interviewing me. Uh, <laughs> if I had any suspicion that things would turn out that way, uh, I'd probably act differently. <laughs> um, but keep in mind, an alicorn of her caliber would be very capable of casting mind control, uh, mind control spell on me and get me to do whatever she wanted me to do, regardless of my wishes. Uh, in which case, depending on my estimated odds, I'd have to consider running away and never looking back upon receipt of the in in interview inter invitation, or construct some plan of weaseling my way out of eating raw meat. <laughs> Good question. Many thanks for the time you've spent with us today, revealing your secrets and establishing your ambitions, Odan of Dans. A final question. Other than conquering Equestria, what's next for Creepy Pasta Salad? It has been a pleasure, friend. I'm quite flattered that you'd think I'd be a good gubernatorial figurehead. Um, <laughs> Endeavors for the future include trying to attend a brony convention. It seems to me like everybody already seems to know everybody in this fandom and always seem to meet up at these, you know, cons. Uh, I'd like to go to one and interact and hopefully get my name out there to a few more people. Uh, I'm going to try to get some of my older readings featured on Equestria Daily sometime. Uh, as you know, I've been featured there three times already for The Week, Painless, and most recently, The Severing of Friendship. Uh, since EQD has changed its audio reading submission requirements, I can offer up stories that I hadn't been able to submit before. I don't think all of them qualify, but we'll see what they will allow in due time. As for readings, uh, the only things that I'm looking into right now are stories to do for a bad fanfic reading with a uh, unique SKD, and uh, reading uh, the sequel to the, S the Severing of Friendship, which is Reconnections by A Fistful of Apples. Uh, I also have some recommendations from you to consider, and uh, but other than that, it's pretty nebulous until I, unless I start getting some major ideas for verbose videos, which I have been doing a, a few of uh, lately. Thank you for your time.